Hello, and welcome to episode three of my new series, Serial Sketch Sunday. Ooh, that's a lot of S's. Uh, in today's video, I want to go ahead and apologize because I am struggling horrendously with some asthma issues due to all of the smoke and dust in the air. It's just been blowing over into our state and killing my lungs. So I want to apologize in advance. Hopefully it won't be too bad. Uh, but with that, if you're new here, I'm Nikki. I didn't think I said that. Uh, this is my channel and I am working on, you know, uh, stepping up my game. So with that being said, today's video may be on the shorter side, but the story is still an interesting one. Also, if you are liking these videos, please be sure that you subscribe to my channel and that you turn the bell icon on so that you never miss a beat. Also, please leave a like if you like it, and should you choose, a kind comment is always appreciated. With that being said, let's just go ahead and jump into the disclaimer. Disclaimer. All information provided in the telling of the story is provided with the intention of education and is not meant to hurt or offend anyone that may have been involved in these stories. I have gathered this information from various sources, which you may find in the description box below. I have done my best to condense it down. Should you feel I missed something interesting or important to the serial killer profile, please leave it down in the comments below. With that, the following video is intended for mature audiences. We are talking about serial killers and their crimes. Viewer discretion is advised. So to start off, I, I don't know why I keep picking these ones with these names that I can't pronounce, but I'm going to say her name as best as I can, and then that will be the last time you hear me use her full name. Leonarda Sansuli, who we will now refer to as Leo, was born April 18th, 1894, in a small southern Italian town of Montea. Leo's early life was nothing to write home about. She was the product of rape, and to make matters worse, when her mother found out that she was pregnant with Leonarda, she was forced to marry her rapist. This man would die when Leo was a toddler, and her mother would remarry. However, the damage was done. Her mother was emotionally abusive, and they also lived in poverty. To say her childhood was turbulent is an understatement. Due to her treatment, she attempted to take her life twice as a young adult. Remember, mental health wasn't really known at this time, and the types of therapies that could be used to help somebody struggling were not known as well. If you find yourself struggling, please check out my description box for the suicide hotline. You are not alone. Though she struggled with mental health issues as a young adult, she grew into a woman that knew what she wanted. Leo would meet and marry her husband, Raphael, Pansardi in 1917. This was against her parents' wishes. See, they had already set her up with a wealthy suitor, and she just wasn't into him. So instead, she married a simple registry clerk, and that was it. From that point on, she believed that her mother had put a curse on her. You see, she was very superstitious and was known to seek the help of fortune tellers and palm readers. She was told that her children wouldn't survive into adulthood. She then went on to have 18 children. Let me break it down for you. Four miscarriages, 10 deaths in youth, and four survivors that she treasured dearly. But her most of all favorite was her eldest son, Giuseppe Pansardi. Leo would find herself seeking the guidance of a traveling Romani fortune teller. She told Leo, in your right hand, I see prison. In your left, a criminal asylum. I don't know why, but that's just what she sounds like in my head. <laughs> Moving on. In 1927, Leo was imprisoned for fraud. Upon release, she moved her family from Potenza to Lacedonia. But sadly, on July 23rd, 1930, the Arapina earthquake struck and destroyed her family's home. Leo and her family then moved to Corrigio, where our story unfolds. While Leo's family may not have been particularly wealthy, she was able to open a small soap shop. She became a very well-respected, popular, and nice gentlewoman who was also a doting mother and good neighbor. 
it was not a surprise that her store would become so popular. In 1939, Leo's eldest son, Giuseppe, would enlist in the Italian army to help with the preparation for World War II. His mother being superstitious and fearing that she may lose her favorite son in the war, turned to human sacrifices. It is unclear where this idea came from, as there were no known Romani beliefs or superstitions that would embrace human sacrifices. It was also against the Roman Catholic beliefs. Leo's first victim was a 73-year-old local spinster named Faustina Seti. Leo invited Seti to her home under the guise of getting her set up with a husband abroad. Leo provided fictitious letters from the supposed friend looking for an affectionate woman to marry. She then instructed, instructed Seti to write letters to her family detailing the trip abroad basically to cover her tracks should anyone come looking for them. Seti sold her whole life away to go to Pola to be with this man she was being set up with. All she wanted was a lifelong companion. Instead, she got a drugged cup of coffee and an ax to the back. And now, quotes from a serial killer. I threw the pieces into a pot added seven kilos of caustic soda, which I had bought to make soap, and stirred the whole mixture until the pieces dissolved into a thick, dark mush that I poured into several buckets and emptied into a nearby septic tank. As for the blood in the basin, I waited until it coagulated, dried it in the oven, ground it and mixed it with flour, sugar, chocolate, milk, and eggs, as well as a bit of margarine. Kneading all the ingredients together, I made lots of crunchy tea cakes and served them to the ladies who came to visit, though Giuseppe and I also ate them. Sorry about that, it had to be said. Leo then took Seti's 30,000 Italian lire, equivalent to $17.94 at the time, or $332 today, which was Seti's life savings from being set up with a husband or so she thought, and Leo had her son send some letters while he was visiting Pola, essentially solidifying that Seti had left on her own and Leo was not involved. On September 5th, 1940, Leo found her next victim, a 55-year-old woman named Francesca, and I don't know how to pronounce her last name, it's on the screen. Once again, Leo conned her victim into believing that she was being set up for a teaching job abroad in Placenza. Again, she had her victim write letters to their family detailing the trip abroad for this amazing opportunity, and Leo would ask her son yet again to toss some letters in the mail while he was there visiting. Everyone assumed all was going well and that nothing had happened, but what had really happened is she drank that spiked wine, fell unconscious, and was promptly murdered by Leo in the same manner as the first. She pocketed the money and baked that woman into tea cakes, chocolate, and soap. Her third victim would be her last. 53-year-old Virginia Cassop... Cassop... Cassiopo 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 Virginia C. She ended up in the pot like the other two. Her flesh was fat and white. When it had melted, I added a bottle of cologne. And after a long time on the boil, I was able to make some most acceptably creamy soap. I gave bars to neighbors and acquaintances. The cakes, too, were better. That woman was really sweet. Sorry again. This time, Leo had messed up. Virginia had a great relationship with her sister-in-law. And her sister-in-law did not believe for one minute that... Virginia had just up and left, and she sure as hell didn't believe those letters. 
She had also witnessed Virginia entering Leo's home during the supposed time of departure. So she quickly reported Virginia as missing to the Regaggio Emilia police. And the police were also able to trace Virginia's registered bonds back to Leo who had cashed them. Leo had also gifted some of this woman's jewelry to her friends, which was also traced back to her for identification. And let's just say Leo was out of control. She was spending money outside of her usual means, which drew unnecessary attention to her. And a witness had watched Virginia go in and never come back out. And this witness was quoted as saying that when she went to Leo's home, that there was no sign of Virginia, mind you, who hadn't left, but there was a foul smelling concoction on the stove. Care to take a guess what it was? Mm. Leo was promptly arrested and denied, denied, denied. That is until her favorite son, Giuseppe, was brought in and they shifted the blame to him. See, they believed that he was involved due to the short amount of time it had taken these killers to dismember the bodies. Roughly two hours under. Well, they did not believe that Leo was capable of doing this. She then broke down and admitted everything. And to prove that she was the one that had committed all the crimes on her own, she was taken down to the morgue and, kid you not, was asked to dismember her body just as she had before. And her time, drum roll please, 12 minutes. A whopping 12 minutes. I'm sorry, I'm getting out of control. This story just blows my mind. I just can't believe each week what I'm like learning. It, it, it's crazy. If you haven't already, shameless self-promotion. Uh, check out the first and second video linked in the cards above. And they will also be in the description box should you uh, need to click in there to share it or do whatever. All right, anyways, back to the story. I'm sorry, I got a little out of control, but it's just so unbelievable how these serial killers work. And like each week I am truly blown away by something in the story. Let's, let's get back to it. Her trial lasted only a few days. She was quoted as saying the following during her trial to correct the prosecutor. I gave the copper ladle, which I used to skim the fat off the kettles, to my country, which was so badly in need of metal during the last days of the war. I'm sorry, could you imagine sitting there and hearing this woman say how her copper ladle is equivalent to the three human sacrifices, the three human beings whose life she took for her own motivations? Uh, wow. But moving on. As if that wasn't creepy already, she was given 30 years in prison and three years in a criminal asylum. Yep, yep, you hear that? 30 years in prison, three years in a criminal asylum, much like the Romani woman had predicted years prior. Creepy. Leo passed away at the age of 79 while still in the asylum in Pozzuoli. Her cause of death was cerebral apoplexy, a type of oh gosh, a type of hemorrhage. She was returned to her family for burial, and the plots, plots, the pots, axes, and other items used in her crimes were donated to a criminology museum in Rome, which are on display for all that are curious. I sure hope I can make it to Rome one day. In 1979, a movie named Love and Magic in Mama's Kitchen by Lena Wertmuller, as well as a 1983 Broadway play, were inspired by Leo's case. With that, Leo will forever be known as the soap maker of Correggio, making you question every handmade product you will receive from your loving friends and family. You're welcome. I hope you found the third episode of my new series enjoyable. If you did, please be sure to leave a like down below, maybe a kind comment. Also, don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell icon if you haven't already so you don't miss a beat. Also, check us out on Instagram for more arty things. Thank you so much for watching and supporting. See you guys next week.
Bye.